7, blessed are the merciful. In verse 1 of chapter 5, and seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Now, as we've discussed before, these build upon each other, these Beatitudes, and in verses 3 through 5, we're really talking about what? The emptiness of a person who, who has nothing. They have nothing to offer God. They have nothing to, 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 to pay for their own sins. They are morally, spiritually bankrupt, and they are grieving over their sin. They come grieving over the sin and the misery of their condition, and they are, they are meek before the Lord. They're, they're willing to understand, listen, I, I need to obey you. I need to seek after you. And then as we saw last time, they are, they are, they are, they are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, okay? A, a true believer in Christ, you may not read the Bible all the time, and you may not get something out of it all the time. You know, it used to be, you know, at, I was in a group for a while, and we would meet, and we would get together and talk about the things that God had shown us uh, in, our, in our daily time with Him. And there are just sometimes He didn't show me anything, okay? Uh, and, and, you know, but, but you always feel like you're you know, in a group, you're compelled to find something, you know, but he may not, but you still keep reading it. You keep studying. You keep wanting to know him because what God is going to do in our lives when we're saved is he's going to give us a desire. Why? This desire comes because his spirit lives within us to know the word of God so that we can glorify the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's why I encouraged you last time just to really get into God's word and just dig into it. Well, tonight we look at this section here in verse 7 where he says, Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The mercy of God. Uh, when we talk about God is rich in mercy, that God's mercies are brand new every day, uh, that's, that's so wonderful. But also, this mercy that is God's is also ours. God develops within his children his character, doesn't he? Okay? And one of those characteristics of who he is is mercy, okay? That we will have mercy towards others. Now, and he says that merciful people are the ones who what? Well, they are the ones, uh, they obtain mercy from God. They are merciful, they obtain mercy from God. And so we want to look at what these things mean. Now, what, how does a heart become merciful? Well, we've seen already that when we come to him, poor in spirit and and, and mourning over sin and meek and hungering and thirsting, that what is God doing? He's developing within us who He is. He's, he's giving us a new heart. And we become merciful because why? Because God has given us His mercy. Okay? Well, anything that God does good for us is because of His mercies, right? Anything that God does for us is because of His mercies. Okay? Sometimes we might think it's not so good. But God gives to us what we need to have and what He desires to give us. So the key to becoming a merciful person is to become a broken person, isn't it? Okay, To be broken before the Lord. You know, you get the power to show mercy from the real feeling that's in your heart that you owe everything you are and have just to His divine mercy. Day by day, we're praising and thanking Him for His mercy. Mercy, And so if we want to become truly merciful people, it's imperative that we have a view of God and ourselves that helps us to, stay, to, to say with all our heart that all that we have comes from Him. Okay, We deserve hell, don't we? Now, we don't like to talk about that, but we do. I remember saying that in a, in a meeting one time that we deserve hell. And I had, I think, two or three people came to me afterwards and said, you know, really, this is not the place for that. And I said, well, it's a church, isn't it? I mean, you know, but you see, people don't want to hear that, okay? I was um, reading of somebody who had, during this time, I think last weekend, this guy 
had, or the last two weekends, he had listened to 18 different services by the largest churches in America during this time where everybody's at home. And he said, I was just curious what they were saying. And he said, only one guy gave a halfway gospel message. The rest of them, and if I mention their names, you'd know who they were. The rest of them all talked about how to have how to have uh, strength for the day and how to be happy during this time and creative ways that you could spend time with your family during this time. And he said, what happened to the church of the living God that you preached the gospel, you preached the word of God? You know, and a lot of times people will say, well, we don't need to hear the gospel all the time. Martin Luther would disagree with you because they ask him, why do you always preach on the justification by faith, he said, because every week you forget it. You see, we forget the gospel. We forget the doctrines of God and the doctrines of grace. We forget those things, and we have to be reminded of them. When did the church suddenly become the place where you come for a weekly pep talk of how you are to make it through the week, or how you're to make your marriage sizzle, or how you're to be able to climb higher mountains and and, 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 and achieve greater things in your life. What is all that about? It has nothing to do with the Word of God. And yet we find that so many uh, pastors and churches, that's the direction that they've gone. We need the Word of God, don't we? We need God's Word, and we need to just give it straight and direct and let God deal with us, okay? Okay. Um, you know, I think only uh, when, when these kinds of things happen that we're going through, uh, it's a way of weeding out uh, people who don't belong to God. Because those who are strong in their faith at the beginning of this trial will be stronger in their faith at the end of it. Why? Because they've, they've had the same God all this time. He has never failed them. He's never let them down. And He is going to help them. But we must be broken before the Lord. That means we're not doing our part and he's doing his part. Okay, now there's a time and place when we can discuss that, but we need to understand that God doesn't do so much and then we do the rest. Okay, Mormonism teaches the atonement is like this, is that, is that Christ died on the cross for our sins and what he was not able to do, we, we do. We complete it by our works. That's not scriptural, okay? And if we have to do even one work to complete what he did, he didn't do anything. And there's no grace involved. You see, you can't mix works with grace. That's what Paul was telling uh, the churches in Galatia, okay? That it's not by any works that we do. Now, so we become broken before the Lord. We see ourselves as we really are. And then... Another question we need to think about from this passage is, what is merciful? What is a merciful person really like? Well, sometimes it's helpful if we can see it contrasted in Scripture. So I want you to look with me just a, a few Scriptures here. Matthew uh, chapter 9, Matthew the ninth chapter. Matthew chapter 9. And... In verse 10, notice what he says, Matthew chapter 9, beginning in verse 10. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house, behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why eateth your master with publicans and sinners? But when Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that are sick. But go ye and learn what that meaneth. I will have mercy and not sacrifice. For I am not come to call the righteous, but the sinners to repentance. Well, here you have uh, this contrasted with what? Mercy is contrasted with, with sacrifice, okay? Jesus takes this from Hosea chapter 6, and he basically is saying, listen, God told the people in Hosea's time, you know, they were doing all of these sacrifices to try to please God because God had said, you're going to go into uh, slavery because of your idolatry. They began to sacrifice. They began to have burnt offerings. 
And God says, it's not your offerings that I want. I want you to know me. The knowledge of God is better than these sacrifices you're doing. You see, you can do all of those religious sacrifices and it's meaningless because you're not needing the mercy of God then. You think you can satisfy what God is saying. So Jesus tells these uh, Pharisees, he is saying, listen, I didn't call, come to call the righteous to repentance. I came for the sick. What a tremendous thing is that here he is. He is the great physician, seeing sinners as, as sick and miserable in need of this physician. And no matter how much money they had, it wasn't enough. Okay? They needed him. But all that the Pharisees could see here was this ceremonial issue of being contaminated because they were eating with sinners. That's all they could see. Okay? They couldn't see the fact that Jesus was helping people, ministering to people, changing lives. All they could see was, hey, wait a minute, you're not supposed to eat with sinners. Now, should we hang out with sinners just to hang out with them? No, I don't think so. But is it okay to meet with sinners and, and even eat with them and even get to know them so that we might share with them what? The Word of God. Every time Jesus went with a sinner, something that glorified God happened. Okay? He didn't just go down and find you know, uh, the town drunk and say, hey, let's go fishing together. We haven't done that in a while. No. Anytime he came upon a sinner or they came to him, there was something that happened that brought glory to God of a changed life. Okay? So the mercy was shown here. Look at another example. Look back farther in Matthew, Matthew chapter 23. Matthew 23. Matthew, the 23rd chapter. And we're going to begin in verse 23. He says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone, ye blind guides, which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. Now, those are pretty tough words, right? Uh, What's the contrast here? Well, the contrast here, the opposite here of mercy, is this idea of straining at gnats. Okay? Uh, you know, they are uh, they're going after all of this stuff that's peripheral stuff, but they're missing the point. Okay? Uh, you know, they, the Pharisees were real big on all the phylacteries on their garments and, and being called master and being called teacher and all these things, uh, but they were hypocrites, weren't they? They, you know... They made sure the outward appearance looked good, but they were missing the point of the inner man. Okay? And so they would strain at a gnat of the fine little parts of the law. Now, it's interesting to note that the, that the Pharisees wrote interpretation of the law, didn't they? And so they wrote this, their own interpretation to make sure that everybody followed the law. Now, there was an important part of that, and the reason why they were doing that is that it started out as a good thing that when they came back from captivity, of their 70-year captivity, there arose this group of people that later on became called the Pharisees, that their, that their whole point was to make sure that nobody committed idolatry again in Israel. Nobody in Judah would, commit an, you know, would, would, would worship an idol, so they made sure everybody knew the law. And then they made sure that they taught them what the law meant. And they made sure that they wrote out the teachings of what they said the law meant. So they came up with things like, and we'll see this in the Sermon on the Mount later on, is that they came up with things like, uh, you know, uh, uh, you can't carry, you know, you know thou shalt not, uh, 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 that, that they were to observe the, uh, the, uh, the Sabbath day, rather, okay? So here they are observing the Sabbath day, but to make sure that they did, they had all these other laws. You couldn't cook on the Sabbath day. You couldn't walk more than a mile on the Sabbath day. You couldn't do uh, any work on the Sabbath day. So if a Roman soldier were to come by, you know, they could command them to carry their garment for a mile. But if it was on the Sabbath day, 
they would make sure that they counted every step and they stopped as soon as that mile came. But how the Pharisees would get around this is that they would, um, they would carry their cloak with them or wear it. And when they walked a mile on the Sabbath day, uh, they, would, they would sit down and they would put the cloak over them and say, this is my dwelling place. Then they would get up and they'd walk another mile. And they could do that all day long. And then go back the way they came and finally come to their real home. You see, those were just like straining at gnat stuff. And Jesus is saying, that's all you're doing. And there are people like that, that every little thing has to be according to what they think that God is talking about rather than just looking at the Word of God. And we have to all be careful of that, okay? You know, when you start learning stuff and you want to start sharing what you know with people, you can become, I know I did it early on, became very overbearing. Okay, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't do the other thing. But I had to really come to the fact that really we need to not worry about that stuff. God will change people's hearts, won't he? Our job and our privilege is to just to declare that there's life in Jesus Christ. And we teach what that means. So he is saying to these Pharisees, woe unto you because, you know what? You have missed the weightier things of the law, like mercy. Like showing mercy. Like, uh, you know, uh, like faith and, and the law of, of judgment. Of, of, listen, those are important things. What God says about his word, not just what we think that it means. And so mercy is so important here. When Jesus says, I'll have mercy and not sacrifice, and you're straining at gnats and swallowing a camel, you're missing the whole point of everything. Now, that's a great obstacle for, for the Pharisees and for many people today as well. You see, we can't emphasize only on the trivial things. Look, if you would, another passage over in the Gospel of Luke for a moment. Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10, familiar passage here, of uh, the great, uh, the good Samaritan. And uh, notice what it says beginning in verse 25 of Luke chapter 10. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he, willing to justify himself, said unto Jesus, And who is my neighbor? And Jesus answering said, A certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho, fell among thieves, which stripped him of his raiment, wounded him, departed, leaving him half dead. And by chance there came down a certain priest that way, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he was at the place, came and looked on him and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the morrow when he departed, he took out two pence, gave them to the host and said unto him, Take care of him, and whatsoever thou spendest more, when I come again I will repay thee. Which now of these three thinkest thou was neighbor unto him that fell among the thieves? And he said, He that showed mercy on him. Then said Jesus unto him, Go and do thou likewise. Well, there are some things about this passage. Jesus tells the man to go and do what? Show mercy. The whole point was what? Showing mercy. The priest didn't show mercy. The Levite wouldn't show mercy. The Samaritan who would not have been shown mercy by any of those, even the, probably the man in the ditch, shows mercy to this man going down to Jericho. And so this guy asking the question, the lawyer, he gets it. He says, yeah, mercy. So go and do likewise. Well, what is it to show mercy here? Well, notice in this story that uh, 
mercy sees the distress, doesn't it? Mercy can see the distress that people are going through. Uh, this Samaritan came where he was and saw him. He saw this man. He said, oh my, this guy is over in the ditch. He's hurt. He didn't just say, what kind of a mess is that guy in? Okay. Now, that's easy for us to do sometimes, uh, especially in the, in the society we live, because we see people that are on the street in tents, and we get tired of seeing them after a while. And we think, gosh, you know, these people, you know, why don't they get it together? And, and we realize that many of them are on drugs, and many of them are mentally ill, and, and others have other problems. We, it's seldom that we really think about the fact that, you know what, that, that man sitting in that tent, or that woman sitting in that tent, or on the street, was once somebody's little boy or little girl. That was once somebody's pride and joy. That was somebody's, you know, son who was playing on the football team or the girl who was, who was uh, you know, doing gymnastics or whatever. And we forget that they had lives before that, that sin robbed them of, that Satan destroyed their lives. And sure, their sin caused it. It was involved in it. But here they are on the street. And sometimes we have to see beyond just the fact that I'm tired of seeing people on the street to the fact that we need to see the distress. But I think we have to be careful in that because I think it's better to let God lead us to that distress rather than us just going trying to apply everything to everybody because they're not paying attention anyway. So we have to pray, God, I want to help these people. I want to do what I can but you've got to lead me to the right person. You know, we can't do everything for everybody. But this mercy sees the distress. It also responds with compassion or pity. That's what he did. He had compassion on him. And then he came with a practical effort to help him. Okay, it's one thing to see the distress of somebody. It's another thing to have compassion. But it are many times that compassion will stop. And that's not showing mercy then. Mercy is not just feeling sorry for somebody. Mercy is feeling sorry for them and with them, but then saying, this is what needs to be done. They need this kind of help. I'm going to help them any way that I can. And that's what he did. And then it sees beyond the race or the religion of the person. You see, he's a Samaritan. He's a half-breed Jew. He has a warped, strange religious tradition, and he has, he's hated by all the Jews, but you've got to look beyond that, okay? You can't, look, you can't look at people and say, well, you know, I, can't, I don't really like to help this race of people. I don't want to help this group of people. They're all people, right? They're all people that need the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is what this Samaritan story shows us about this Mercy, And actually, it's, it's, it's similar to what Jesus has said in Matthew 9, 13, where he says, I will have mercy and not sacrifice. Go and show mercy like the Samaritan, not like the priest and, and Levite, he says to this lawyer. In other words, God desires that we have mercy, but it has to be practical mercy. How did God show us his mercy? In the same way, did he just simply say, oh, those poor sinners, I don't know how they got like this. I gave them a beautiful garden. I gave them everything that was wonderful. And, 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 and they messed it up. Somehow they messed it up. You know, God wasn't unaware of what they'd done. He knew it was going to happen before he made the world. But what we need to understand is that God's mercy was, was extended to us in the death of his son. He gave his son. And that was God's mercy. Because God knew that we needed payment for sin. And who among us could pay for our own sin? Not one of us. Not one of us. We could just simply be punished for our sins. We could never pay for it. Jesus came and did that. You see, this is what we, what we need to understand, that this mercy uh, is given to us by God and we show that same mercy to others. It's the same thing. The Bible tells us that the, that, that the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts. What does that mean? Does that just simply mean, oh, well, love came and filled my heart. 
No, it's given to us to do what? To show that same love to someone else. Okay? God does not want us to interpret love. He doesn't want us to interpret mercy. He doesn't want us to interpret goodness or any of the things that he says we're to have. No, he gives those to us. They are developed within us as we exercise our faith in obedience to them. That's how we grow. That's how we become more like Christ. Now, so when we think about this, another question I, I began to think about was, was simply this. Uh, should a merciful person then always show mercy? Should we always show mercy? Well, that's a loaded question, isn't it? Because we think about the person who is a parent who has to discipline their child. They may have to spank a child. That's not on the video. All right. they, they may have to spank the child. They, they might have to do something. Well, why don't they just show mercy and just let the child do what it wants to do? That's not mercy. That's not love. Okay? Uh, can a Christian be consistently merciful and yet they are an employer who pays good wages, who is a, a good employer, takes good care of their people, but dismisses someone who's irresponsible on their job. Why don't they just let them go? Well, because that might harm what the others are doing. That might destroy the whole business. That might also cause that person to think they can get away with stuff all the rest of their life. You see, we can, we can look at this, we can look at, at people who work in, in government. And um, I'm sure there are Christians there, but I don't know how they can be very good ones sometimes. But they're passing laws, they're passing all kinds of things. They can show mercy in those, but there may be a time when they have to be really severe, maybe with passing stiffer drunk driving laws or something like that. Where's their mercy? Well, it's towards those who are suffering, isn't it? What about a person in a church, a leader in a church, who has to show mercy and, and to love the people, and yet who has to follow the biblical mandate for church discipline? How can you be merciful and still show discipline? Well, because you're being obedient to God. All of these spheres of life, all of these areas of life, they all have something in common, and that's the fact that in all of these things there has to be a mingling of mercy and justice at times. Sometimes, listen, a judge who is, who is trying a case and who is hearing the evidence and they come to the verdict and the judge who is known for his mercy, he's known for his fairness, he's known for, for all of these things, he sentences someone to life imprisonment. And you say, well, what kind of mercy is that? Well, it's mercy to those who may suffer because of this person. But yet the judge, the judge could still make sure that the family of that person is taken care of. That's mercy. You see, you can show both justice and mercy. And that's what God does, doesn't he? Listen, there's going to come a day when God casts all the unbelieving into the lake of fire. That's justice. That's judgment coming down. But he shows mercy to us. Why? Because we deserve it? No, mercy is not given to you if you deserve it. As a matter of fact, if you deserved it, it would never be mercy and you'd never get it. He shows his mercy by not giving you or me what we deserve. And the reason for that is because of what his son has done. That he paid. Trust me, sin was paid for. Okay? You know, somebody can say, well, how can God let us off with our, you know, with our sins? He didn't. He took it out on his son. It was paid for. Sin was paid for. You don't have to pay for it. It's already been paid for. Well, what do we do? I mean, what happens when a person goes to hell? Well, they're not paying for their sin there. They're simply being punished. That they were a rebellious person against God. And they were filled with sin. And they wanted nothing to do with God. It's so important that we that we understand that God has two sides here, but both can be merciful. It's important that we show this same mercy. 
Now, when we think about this, going back to Matthew, just for a moment, Matthew 5, he says, Blessed are the merciful. That word blessed is a word that means we've looked at before. Completely satisfied. Happy is another word you can use for that, but it's more than just being happy, okay? It is, it is completely satisfied. We're not looking for something else to fulfill our lives. You see, I, I think that one of the, one of the key things, uh, at least as I think about stuff, uh, since we can't really do much else, I, I think that, that this is a great opportunity for God's people to reflect upon all the things that we think we need to be fulfilled. And we really don't. I mean, there are people that think they just have to have something new every day. And they'll go to the store and walk aimlessly around the aisles. You've seen them. They're not really looking for anything. They're just looking for something to buy. I think right after all this started, I, I remember going to uh, a store and uh, some man, people are like trying to get toilet paper. They're trying to get, you know, food. They're trying to get this. You know what I mean? They're like mad in there. And um, some guy walks walks to the check stand and pays for a TV and walks out the door. And I'm thinking, okay, you got something on sale here, didn't you? That's what you were looking for. You don't care about the other stuff. Now, maybe he had piles of stuff at home, but I just thought how weird this is. This is America right here. This is a guy that's saying, listen, I don't care how bad it gets. I'm taking care. I need a new 55-inch, 72-inch screen. I've got to have it. Well, that's crazy. But here in this time that we have, as God's children, we can't be responsible for what anybody else does. But we can focus on, God, am I completely satisfied? You know, and I've really been praying about this, you know, uh, I, I, during all of this stuff, because I get antsy if I don't have something to do. And I found a bunch of stuff to do. It's just that it's stuff that I've had to do for a long time that I didn't want to do. And, uh, you know, there's a reason I didn't want to do, do it. It's work. And um, so I'm, I'm really trying just to be just to be gracious and kind. And if my wife, you know, my, my wife is one of these people, a wonderful person, but my wife is one of these persons that if you, if you did a bunch of stuff, she'll find one thing you haven't done. Well, how come that's still done like that? I don't know. So I'm trying to be merciful and kind the whole time and, and just be gracious. And, and, and because I, I just think that's something we all have to work on, don't we? You know, we, we say we know the Lord. We say that we love the Lord. Well, that love and that knowledge has to come out of us. Mercy towards others. They may not deserve it, but we're giving it to them anyway. So should a person always show mercy? Well, no. I mean, uh, sometimes you can't. But you show mercy anyway to an extent that you don't do all that you could against them. You don't completely destroy them. You see? Now, another question I thought about is that why is it that it says here that only merciful people find mercy from the Lord? Is salvation by grace through faith? Of course it is. But what do we mean by here? Well, the people who receive mercy from him, have there, are they the ones who have been merciful? No. God has given us mercy already. But he gives us new mercies every morning, doesn't he? New mercies. You know, salvation is not by our works. We can't earn anything from God. It's because an earned mercy is a contradiction, isn't it? You can't earn something that you got not deserving it. If you get anything good at judgment, it's mercy, 100% mercy. And that helps me at least to think, gosh, you know, I don't know if you've ever done this. I shouldn't be telling you this, but when you say, how did this guy even get through the pastor exam? Oh, if there is one. Um, there are times, even though I was raised in a Baptist church all of my life, there are times as I look back 
that I see how Catholic most of us really are. That we're always early on in our lives. Remember, before you were even saved, you're making deals with God. God, if you let me do this, if you have, give me this, I promise I'll do that. And, and we're, 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 we're doing this kind of this thing, God, I'll do this, you do that, and we make this wonderful deal with God. Well, even as a Christian many times, we're thinking, oh, you know what? Uh, God, I promise I'm going to spend at least two hours in prayer if you just help me with this. Why do we do that? What are we doing? We're trying to add to what God has already promised that he would do. We're trying to throw something we are doing, and that what does that do? That takes away from God's mercy. That takes away from his grace. It's not about us promising anything to God in order for him to do. He has already done everything. If God did nothing else for you ever again, he's done more than you deserve. And we have to understand that it's not about us bargaining with God. You know, you see these prayers that people have made about, um, well, we look in the scripture and we'll see when Abraham is interceding for Sodom, right? And Lord, if there are 50 righteous, 40, 30, 20, 10, uh, and we think, gosh, you know, I'd like to be able to pray like that, bargaining with God. Well, Abraham's not really bargaining with God. What is he doing? He is, he is praying based upon he, what he knows of God's mercy. That nobody deserves in Sodom to be let off, much less even 10 people. And there weren't 10. They couldn't even find two. Okay, So here, here we see this. Or you, 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 you begin to look at the fact that you know, Moses is praying for the people and, and, and all these things. Or Gideon is saying, you know, let me put out a fleece here or there. Fleeces really are not the best way to pray. Okay? Don't, don't, don't go back. I've heard people say, well, it's in the Bible, therefore we, we can do it. No, there are some things in the Bible that are given to show us what not to do. But, well, God still honored it. Well, because Gideon didn't know anything. Did you know that the Bible is very interesting? It says, there was a time when God winked at that ignorance. Is that, have you ever read that verse? It's in 2 Corinthians. And does it ever bother you? How much winking has God done, God done towards us? But he doesn't do it anymore. Why? Because he's given us his complete word. Why do we need to be in ignorance anymore? Read it. But you see, we think this, you know, God, if you do this, and I'll know you're really in it. Just pray God's will be done. Now, I, I've seen over the years uh, when I, people have asked me, Pastor, will you pray for this? Or people, friends of mine will ask me to pray for something. And I always ag agree, I'll say, and I usually will say, I'll be praying the will of the Lord be done. And they act as if I've insulted them. One guy said, well, if that's all you're going to do, why bother to pray? Well, because that's how Jesus said to pray. You see, the problem is not so much getting God to do stuff. It's in getting our hearts right before him. We're the issue. Because if we truly love our Father, and I know that we do, and we truly love him, then whatever he does great. But what do you, we want him to do more. And God says, I want to do what I want to do. God only answers prayers the way that he wants to answer them. Okay? No one has ever changed the mind of God. Well, then why bother to pray? Because he said to. Did you not have a parent like that? Dad, why do I have to do this? Because I said so. And, and that had to be enough because you weren't getting anything else. And God says, hey, I've given you this whole book, 66 little separate books that say, because I said so. 
oh, listen, we need to pray more for us than we do for others. That our hearts are right. But more importantly, we need to pray that God will, will help us to be merciful because when we stand before Him, it's not going to be our time card we hold up to God and say, eight hours of mercy right here. No, God wants to look at the chart on our heart. What did you do? How did you live? Did you show mercy? And every time we show mercy, there are those times that we show mercy to someone, we're thinking inwardly, well, they, they deserve this. And we are showing mercy to them. Why? Because God has shown us mercy. And we have so much to give. You have more to give to people than you think you do. There are more reserves within you than you say, I just can't put up with, with crazy people, stupid people, foolish people. Yeah, you can. And just to prove it, God is going to put you in the midst of them. And you're going to be dealing with them. And you'll stop putting up with them because you'll start praying for them. And then you'll start showing mercy and you start helping them. Because God wants you to understand, I sent my son to your planet to dwell among a bunch of the same kind of people that you don't want to put up with. And he died. But he was raised again because he wasn't going to leave those people like he found them. They were going to be transformed. Listen, what a tremendous God we serve. Amen? All right, well, let's, let's stop there. We're going to take some prayer requests tonight. Um, just before the service, well, on Monday I had spoken to uh, 